Thank you for joining uh, David Seaton from Seaton Speaks today. We are having a conversation with Dr. Mark Abraham. We've had him featured on Seaton Speaks before. We've also had him on uh, our radio show, the Buchanan and Seaton Show on WVON. He is a, uh, a just a trailblazer in all things uh, education and especially his specialty is uh, raising awareness or raising education for young black men. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Dr. Abraham. Hey brother, thank you for having me. Uh, I'm always humbled when anyone asks me to come on a show and, and share my ideas. So I'm, I'm very appreciative to you know be here today. So thank you. No, absolutely. And thank you for making time on a Saturday afternoon. You and I were having a conversation earlier this week and we were discussing this article about this school district out in Baltimore and it mm -hmm. was centered around this young man who has a 0 0.13 grade point average. And he is at the 50th percentile of his class. That means that 50% of the kids in the class have less than a 0 0.13 grade point average. And mm -hmm. his mother basically was interviewed by the local paper there. And she says, the school failed. It was 100% on the school. They didn't call her and tell her that he was failing, even though she was getting his report cards. The school didn't uh, tell her until his senior year that he couldn't graduate and he had to start over. So she's placing 100% of the blame about what's going on with her son on the school system. And you and I had a really interesting conversation offline. What, what are your initial, what's your initial response to what the mother is saying about the culpability uh, that's going on with her son? Um, you know, and I know we, we, we take kind of like different perspectives on this, uh, you know, um, I, I would say that I will probably put about 75%, 80% blame on the, on the, um, on the school system. When you look at the data of that school, j just from what that article read, we know that about 50% of the kids are going to be failing this year. So we know at best based off of what the article reported, only 50% of the kids will walk across the stage that, that year. So when you have such a high failure rate, we, we, can, we can point out this one singular case, but I would, I would venture to say without any, without any difficulty that this has been going on for a significant amount of time in this school. This, this is a culture of failure in this school. So this one mom made the news, but I, I, I would, I, dollars to donut, this is not the only case. No, um, agreed. No, so, definitely. So, so, so when, when, the, when the mom says the school failed her, she's correct. You know, she says she's working three, three jobs, three kids. She's running around trying to put food on the table, trying to do what she has to do. The, the onus has to be on the school to own this and say, how can we make this young man be successful and how can we create success? Um, and it starts with the leadership. It starts with the school principal. So I wouldn't say 100% on the, on, on, the, on the school because the, the, the young man has to take onus of this also, right? Right, like we, we got to put some of it on the, on the young man and we got to put a little bit on the parents. This kid is 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old. So he understands what's happening uh, with his grades. And he knows he didn't show up to school, missed over 200 and something days. 272 uh, or 58 days, I think it said. Right. But 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 the, the, the biggest systematic issue is why is this kid missing so many days? And why is the school, why is that even a thing in this school? Here's here, so if, if there's a if there's a leader who's watching this. <clears throat> And that school principal, she's the. I, I did some research because I wanted just to kind of get a little bit more background information. The superintendent actually just hired a new principal for that school for the 2021 school year. So that that they 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 have a black woman there leading the charge. Um, so that principal, you know, we we can't be too hard on her because that's probably not her data. You know, that's that's not her data that. Uh, the, the news is reporting on. But at least the, the superintendent had a wherewithal to say, we need, we need new leadership there. We need new principal. And, and, and that's correct. But, you know, 
what I would say is for, for any leader that's watching, if you have high failure in a school and 50, 60, 70 percent, 80 percent of your kids are failing, 90 percent of your kids are failing, please let me be the first one to say I love you. Because if you love somebody, you're going to tell them the truth. You're the reason why they fail. You're the problem. Well, and again, you and I, like I said, you and I kind of take a, a different uh, approach to this. You're an educational profession, professional. So, so I appreciate you, you know, your, your perspective and that you're bringing your experience to this conversation. That said, I, I can speak in my own situation that when my daughter was a freshman in, uh, was a freshman in high school, she's a sophomore in college now. When she was a freshman in high school, she was underperforming in, in a math class. And initially, the, the, you know, the, 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 the fam- some of the family was going into the school and saying, hey, what's going on with the principal? What's going on with the teacher? Why is my, uh, why is my daughter, why is my niece, why is my granddaughter underperforming in this math class? Then when I got involved, I brought my daughter home for, uh, for, to my home for three, three weeks straight after school. I identified where the disconnect was, helped get her back on track. She's been successful or was successful in math for the remainder of her high school uh, years. So I guess my point is, is that the school is an extension of, and, and this is my question, is the school an extension of the foundation that children receive at home, or are we asking schools to replace perhaps that lack of foundation that a student uh, doesn't receive at home. And when we ask the school to do that at high school, when we're asking the school, we're saying, hey, this student underperformed, the student in this article, and for our listeners, we're gonna put the the link uh, to the story that we're talking about uh, so you can read that. But when when you're talking about a, a student who goes to, for when he's a freshman in high school, he got all Fs, he got two Bs and uh, two Ds and one B. So his foundation was already messed up by the time he got to the ninth grade. Is it fair to ask schools to then replace the lack of foundation that that student didn't receive from zero to 12 years or 13 years old by the time he becomes a freshman in high school? I like Brother Seaton how you, you kind of, you, you kind of position the question with some strong, you know, opinions and strong, <laughs> like, you know, they're never just one question. I actually got to listen to you all the way thoroughly just to get to the, <laughs> what's the question he's asking. Here's the big thing, though. If we have to look at the K through 12 system that that young person was in. Agreed. Because if that kid comes to ninth grade deficient, then what happened in middle school and then what happened in elementary. And we know that only about one out of four black males in the elementary level are reading on grade level. Like, so, you know, when, when we ask these questions, you know, it's, it's always like, for me, like, teachers get paid to do a job, that's to teach. Like the, the administrators get paid to do a job, which is to run an effective school. <clears throat> It's like mechanics get paid to fix cars. Doctors get paid to do a job when you go see an a MD, when you go see a dentist. We're, we're, we're saying we're paying you. This isn't like volunteer work. So if, if a kid comes to your school and they're, and they're not being, uh, if they're not at grade level, like we really need you to teach the kid to get to grade level so that kid can be successful. We, we really need the principal to say, Freshman year, we got a kid that is failing. We need to put the supports in place for that young man to be successful. We actually need to care enough so that we actually say, all right, this kid failed every qu- every grade first quarter. Now we are in crisis mode. There is a problem. We need to put academic in- intervention services in place. We need to get with the counseling team to see why this kid is having trouble. We need to uh, maybe look at some different classes that we could put this kid in. We need to make sure this young man has after school tutoring. Like there should be like a, 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 a conjury of things that should have taken place in this situation. So, you know, when I was a principal, what I would tell families are is this, mom, I know you got to work. You just get them to the school and we're we going to do the rest. We're we going to keep this kid for 10, 11 hours. We're going to make sure 
we're going to own this because we love these kids. We're going to own it to make sure that kid walks across the stage. And if I got to grab that kid myself and take across the stage, I'm going to do it because we care. So we're going to put all the systems in place for that young man or young lady to be successful. And then further that point, remember, you talk about your daughter, which is a beautiful thing. You had advocacy there from the dad, right? You, you, and I would just imagine middle, middle class to upper middle class, you had advocacy there for dad. You had that intervention in place where you hold the school accountable. Um, and you have a female, which is the most educated, a black female, the most educated group in the country. Black females get, there's no, there's no other group that have more education than black females. With black males, that, that's the least educated group in the country. Black males have the lowest graduation rates in the country. So there's so many different nuances with why this situation has happened. That school that we're talking about has a 50% graduation rate for their kids. Statistically, that's what the data said. Sure. In that, in that, that's just all population. I would, I would strongly believe that with looking at that district's uh, data, when you look, looked at their total graduation rate and their black male graduation rate, there's about a 20% gap. So I would venture to say in that school that black males are probably graduating at about 30%, keeping all the data the same, if that makes sense. Yes. Because that's what we see nationally. There's about a 21% graduation rate for black males and white males. So in that school, it, it, it is easy to say that that school for black males probably have a graduation rate around 25 to 30%. That means 70% of black males are failing when they go to that school. And then the, the and this has been quoted by, I said it in 2019 when I wrote my dissertation, people have said it in, in, in uh, research in 2010 and 1999 has been said all, all along. When we talk about black males, the same old conversation comes up. Let's blame the parents. Let's say the parents are the problem. Let's say the community is the problem. Let's say rap music's the problem. We, 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 we hardly want to look in the mirror and say, we are the problem as educators. And, and, and so when I hear, when you hear this, this, this story, it's the same story over and over again. We want to blame the parents for the for the seventy percent failure of of, of a, a subpopulation. Final question, and that's a great answer, I, and I like that answer. But final question, because we don't want to give them too much. We want to make sure people uh, come up, come on to uh, the, listen to the, the follow up interview with you on Friday at, on WVON, uh, the Buchanan and Scene Show. So, final question, and, and you you again in, in our conversation offline, I had an opportunity to think about this a little bit more. You were, you you gave a really good analogy. You said, hey. If you went to a hospital and doc and, and mm -hmm. 70% of the patients who went into that hospital died, you would make a judgment about mm -hmm. the efficacy of that particular hospital just based on their failure rate. Right. But as I started to think about that, right. if you were looking at that hospital, you would really pull back the layers. If, if a cardiologist is saying to 100%, he's saying to 10 patients, hey, you need to take this medicine, you need to lose some weight, and you need to exercise more. And seven out of the 10 patients who he gives that prescription to don't follow the prescription and they die. Then that, that you know, that kind of, that kind of, that colors the result. You, if, if the doctor, if a, if a doctor says, if a cardiologist says, hey, I gave this, this prescription, everybody followed it, and 70% of the people die, that's one thing. But if you say, I gave this prescription to, to 10 people and seven of the 10 didn't follow it and they died, then you can say as the doctor, hey, I, I did my part. So, and, and I'm using that analogy for, for our students to say that whatever, whatever the school does in terms of environment, in terms of curriculum, in terms of everything else, the student still has to show up to school every day ready to learn before any plan that you put in place can be successful. Is that a fair statement to make? No, man, no, it's not. I mean, no, it's, 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 it's a, the doctor actually has to see you to, to, to provide a prescription. Correct. The doctor actually got to show up and actually do their job and actually know something and then actually 
to say this is what I know as an expert to, to do my job. The doctor actually has to say there's something that I believe is going to hold me accountable for doing my job. I actually care, have a conscience for my patients. So I'm going to prescribe them and I'm going to check in with them. Like, so is that really happening in schools, right? Like, so in a school like this, is that happening? I would easily say there's a whole bunch of nonsense going on in this school and teachers aren't teaching. They're not holding kids accountable. Leadership ain't holding teachers accountable. They're not working with their school counselors. They're not using data to drive their decisions. It's a horrible narrative that's surrounded around that school. And then they're not caring for black kids, and black males in particular, to make sure that they're being successful. So, you know, if you want to get into the minutia of what black males actually experience through research when they actually walk into a school, if I walk into a school and I say this, I leave it alone, if I walk into a school and the school makes me feel like they don't care about me, I'm not welcome there, they suspend me all the time, they, they, they're just, you know, I'm, I'm invisible to them. You know how invisible you have to be to a school where a school is just going to every year get you to the next class and get you to the next class and not even think about your schedule? You know how invisible you have to be? Like nobody has stopped. They, they said one teacher said they set up a parent conference. Nobody stopped and said, hmm, this kid failed every class. He needs to go to summer school and he's going back to them same classes again next year. And we're going to provide some academic intervention services for him. And we're going to make sure he gets some tutoring. If none of that happens, man. You, you, so that's that's the black male experience. Either we're gonna get suspended in school, or we're gonna be looked upon as in, as we're invisible if uh, we're not entertaining uh, our white brothers and sisters. If we're not playing football, basketball, baseball, and singing and dancing, that's when we get noticed. Or if we're doing something real bad. Dr. Mark Abraham, like I said, I always love having these conversations because we approach the we approach the subject from different uh, perspectives. I think we're calibrated on the results that we want to see. Uh, I think we have uh, we, ha but I like the dissonance of our conversations. I, I enjoy having these conversations with you. Uh, again, read the article and then join us on WVON 1690 AM, uh, the Buchanan and Seton Show on Friday, I believe Friday the 12th, that uh, you're gonna be on in the 10 o'clock p.m. Central uh, hour and we're gonna have this conversation. We're gonna be, be able to kind of dig more into this conversation because we'll have a, a, an entire hour. Uh, give a shout out to our people really quickly on where they can find and follow you. Well, um, you can follow me on Instagram, all social media platforms, dr. period, M-A-R-C-K underscore Abraham, A-B-R, a-H-A-M, that's on Instagram, uh, Twitter, Dr. D-R period, M-A-R-C-K, Abraham. And I have a book coming out called What Success Looks Like, Strategies for Secondary Principles to Increase Graduation Rates for Young Men of Color. We're talking about this. Principles, how do we make you successful? How do we show you how to increase graduation rates for black and brown males? It's possible. They can graduate at 80, 90, and 100%. It can happen in your school. Can't wait to read that book and can't wait to, to read it and to have a conversation on that book. Really appreciate you making yourself available today. Thank you, man. I always appreciate it. Can't wait to hear, uh, talk to you on Friday. And you guys give me them hard questions, man. So I'm going to <laughs> I'm gonna be loaded for bear that day. You have me going back, read my book. So I'm prepared, man. <laughs> we'll talk to you soon. All right, brother. Thank you.